Good morning, Brian. Hello, Colleen. Hey. Oh, just coming back in. How are you? Well, not bad. I just got back from my walk. Good for you. Yeah. You nice walk your dog. I think it's I'm sorry? You walk your dog? Uh, no, I walk my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a reverse. Okay. <laughs> Where are you uh, sitting? What? Where are you sitting? At my uh, little breakfast nook. Oh, okay. I was going to sit outside today, but it's a little too brisk. Yeah. yeah. Did you guys get that huge rainstorm last night? Um, I was probably dead to the world. I didn't hear anything. It rained here, but really? I did. did it rain hard? Oh, man. It did. For um, not that long, but for part of the time, it sounded like a freight train. Big squall. Yeah, big squall came through. Missed it all. Not, not, didn't, everything is in, you know, nothing blew over, so I assume I'm looking out there right now. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be darned. Yeah. It was really loud, weird, and then it calmed down. Well, in that, in that uh, retired folk, you know, at, at nine o'clock, we're, we're heading to bed. Yeah. Uh-huh. You too will be here someday. I know. <laughs> I'm sure your father tells you that. Oh, I, they doesn't have to tell me. They. They don't answer the phone after about 8 or 8.30, I think. I've got my phone on do not disturb at 9 o'clock. Yeah. yeah. He's, uh, he's in my turn 82 this year. Ah. Yeah. Good for him. He's got nine years on me. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Debbie's fixing her breakfast, so you might hear some background noise. Oh, that's all right. David's back there. See, eating his. Oh food. yeah, hey David. Morning. You're yeah. you're you're getting breakfast too. Yeah. Yeah. See, look look at my uh, see my shirt. Tattooed moose. Yes. <laughs> great bar, great bar and uh, barbecue in uh, Savannah, Georgia. Okay. Uh, Funny. I thought I'd dress up for the meeting. That's nice of you. I got a good phone call from a. Uh, oh, I told you about Herman yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw your, your note about you saw my note about the uh, letter you got, so we can talk about that today if you want. Yeah. Okay. I think if we could get the message out more about. PPP loans that there's still a lot of money remaining. Yeah. And about, but you know, it, it only works for certain people, but it certainly would work for every self employed person. Oh, yeah. So you have. And, oh, good. Yeah. So, but there are some people that are having a terrible time, haven't gotten any pandemic unemployment assistance, haven't. Didn't get applied for an idle loan, uh, idle grant, nothing. Applied for PPP, nothing. So, what, and no word from the uh, SBA. With her, I don't know. How about if I have her call you? Hey, good morning, Cindy. Good morning, Cindy. Good morning. How are you? Good. good. Brian, you know Cindy. Cindy Brian. Hi, Brian. Hello, Cindy. Yeah. Cindy's a school board director and runs the Crescent Water System. <laughs> Dry Creek. Dry Creek, oops. 
Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Dry Creek Water System. I was going to say west of PA. I got the right spot. I just, you got the right spot. Just not too not too far out there. <laughs> and Brian's our board chair, and he's had decades of experience with SBA loans. Was a former bank CEO, that kind of thing. Yes, our board yeah. met last night talking about we should go after th some of the loans. I'm like, I don't think the loans will give us enough money to do the infrastructure, guys. Oh, is that what they? So which, but I mean, Some of them will. well, the PPP loan, did you go after that? Mm -mm. You should. It's, it's uh, eight weeks, especially if you're still operating, it pays your bills for eight, eight weeks of payroll and then plus 25% you can spend on utilities and such. And we don't have to repay the money? You do not. <laughs> if you spend it the right way, you don't. I'll let Brian speak. Yeah, just if you spend it on payroll uh, and uh, your operating costs, such as uh, not the rent or uh, uh, the interest on your mortgage and utilities and phone. Utilities you can use phone. it for rent. You can use it for rent. Okay. Yeah. We don't so, have rent. <laughs> yeah. So I guess so, that's a good thing. But utilities. Right. Utilities and phone. That'd be good. Yeah, uh -huh. I was but on you, the call that clarified you can use it for cell phone and internet as utilities as well. Oh, nice. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. So you really should apply. There's still last last I heard 125 billion remaining. Okay. Yeah. This morning, um, the number was 210 as of last night was what was used. So there's still quite a bit remaining. Right. And, um, so there had been word that it would run out tomorrow but i it doesn't appear that it will based on the average loan size right now um i think it still has a bit of time left i did get um a point of clarification from sba just this morning that i thought would be worthy of sharing because i know a lot of people on this call have worked with first federal or other banks on a ppp and have Real also quick, christine i i want to share this is christine walsh rogers from first federal who's been the project owner of the ppp loans for first fed so go ahead sorry about yeah, that yeah so some um some questions we've been having about people who've been getting the idle money right you've been getting that uh one thousand to ten thousand dollar deposits showing up in your bank accounts and you're also getting the ppp and we've had a lot of um back and forth information from SBA last week as to whether or not the amount of a PPP had to be reduced by the amount of that idle grant that was received. And this morning I received confirmation that it does. And that if folks have received their PPP funding and their idle money already, then the amount of the uh, idle money that they received will not be forgiven from their PPP. So I wanted people to know that whether they're with First Federal, Sound Community right. Bank, Kitsap Bank. It's just important information to have because um, I think for a lot of businesses, the PPP process was happening simultaneously to the mm -hmm. time frame in which the deposits were starting to just show up randomly in your bank accounts. Um, and, uh, and people just didn't know they were going to get that. So, yeah. That doesn't surprise me at all because that's exactly what it said in the congressional language that was passed was that if a person got both, the idle amount had to be subtracted from the forgiveness amount of the PPP. Right. Yeah, so I wanted folks to know that. I mean, if they've got both, it, it's, it's fine. You can spend the money and they'll just have a portion that wouldn't be forgiven, but we want everyone to know because if you wanted to just hold that money for repayment, you can, and I'm going to find out if there's a way to um, submit it earlier to your bank at all. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Christine. You're welcome. So you said a hundred, how much had been used? Of yeah, one to second. I've got the information right here. Okay. Uh, so as of 5 p.m. last night, uh, a total, okay, a total of 181.2 billion had been 
released for 2.38 million loans. That's an amazing amount of business for community and large banks to be doing across the country in, you know, 10 days. Uh -huh. And they put 250 in, correct? 310, but 60 was preserved okay. for the smaller institutions. Okay. Okay, got it. And I feel like in this round, our smaller institution got that benefit as we were able to, so far, everybody who's been qualified in our pipeline, we've been able to secure funding in this second round. Good. That's great. I, yeah, I'd be surprised if it was gone by tomorrow, considering we started with 310 and 181 has been spent and everybody was teed up to submit their applications right away. Hey, good morning, Mike Rykoff. Good morning. Christine. Uh, Walsh Rogers just shared some information um, and that uh, as of 5 p.m. last night, 181.2 billion had been processed through the SBA of the 310 billion. And that, uh, let's see, so that's about 131 billion remaining. So, uh, and then also that, she did get clarification that telephone bills and um, and internet bills are considered utilities and are qualified expenses for the PPP forgiveness portion. And that also, if you received both a one to 10K idle advance, that does get subtracted off the PPP loan forgiveness portion. Um, Mike, since we're on that kind of topic with loans and uh, idle or PPP or SBA information, do you have anything new to share or any updates? Um, <clears throat> no, I mean, the stats that you had are the more updated than the ones that I had with regards to how that's going and, um, yeah. Last I heard is that some people may be in their seventh week before that policy formally gets released. So. so what do you mean at the PPP idle advance? Not the advance, but the forgiveness the policy. Loan. So they wouldn't receive their money until the seventh week of the eight week period? The formal policy as to what oh, the rules okay. are for forgiveness may not be Got available it. until people are into their seventh week of Okay. Their eight week window. Wow, which is crazy. You don't know how yep. to spend it correctly then. Correct. Jeez. Okay. That's Rick Dickinson, uh, SBDC. All right. Um, and then let's see, other subjects I was hoping to talk about. Um, the Pandemic unemployment assistance. I wonder if Lena's on the call. It doesn't look like it. Um, we got pretty um, convoluted process there as well, unfortunately. Um, and they are still processing, um, you know, applications, but. I'm wondering if anybody has had any luck contacting Brandino's local office, that phone number, with pandemic unemployment assistance issues. The number he gave out, uh, it was um, 4572103. No? Have you tried to reach Mike? I have not. I haven't had anybody that I've talked with that's been successful and I'm not sure they've tried. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and then I guess Pauline, we I'll just I'll just yeah. add that we're getting a lot of phone calls from folks who have been trying to reach the local work source office and have not had success. So they're 
calling us. Yeah. Seeing if we can walk them through. And so Rick's been taking those calls and helping where he can. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to let you know that we're yesterday, for example, I got three voicemails from Port Angeles. People sort of really scrambling, having a tough time getting through to anybody there and calling back to us saying, can, is there anything you can do to help? Right. So. I do have Brandino's cell phone number. I'll text him. <laughs> See if, if he can, like, maybe we can get a list of people and then see if we can get them um, uh, some scheduled help today or tomorrow. That'd so, be awesome. Okay, so send me the names of the people and their phone numbers, and I will, and so that's for you too, Mike, or, and I'll contact our other business advisors, and I will send the list to Brandino and see if he will schedule people to contact them. Um, that would also mean, though, that people have to take calls from unknown numbers. So, um, so did, I don't know if people notice the, um, couple of the letters that I sent out yesterday. If, if you didn't receive them, I'll be happy to share them. But, uh, one was from the, the leadership of the House and Republican caucuses on both the, uh, Republican and Democrat side saying that they were, um, they were curtailing the governor's emergency authorities. Um, it was basically that the RCW says that in order for you to be able to enact certain emergency actions, you have to have support of the four caucuses. So Republican, Democrat, you know, those four, and he didn't, and the Republicans are not providing that. So they are they are um, limiting some of the things that he has instituted. I haven't gone back to see what the emergency orders were that they did not uh, give support to. But I was wondering if anybody here on this call has heard about that. No? no. Okay. Um, the other thing is, so Congress, uh, issued $175 billion to small governments uh, through the CARES Act. And so our state based on population received $2.95 billion of that 175. And um, so according to the CARES Act, large counties with more than 500,000 in population that includes King County, Snohomish, Pierce, Spokane, those four counties, and the city of Seattle, because they have a population of more than 500,000, they each get $500 million. And then, so that adds up to one point, uh, I don't remember what amount, uh, well, I should be able to do the math, 1.5 million, right? Yeah, thanks, or 2.5. No? Anyway, I won't go into that detail. <laughs> um, so uh, the, I know, though, that 45% went to those five entities. So there was a remainder of 55% of the $2.95 million that the state was going to receive. And um, that would be, so that's $1.65 million or six, yeah, six, five million that was going to be distributed amongst the counties and the cities in the state. So that's 30, what, there's 39 counties. So uh, 35 counties and 201 cities in the state. So 200 cities that they distribute this funding to, except also the state gets to keep some of the money. And so he determined of the 1.95 million is that right, wait a minute. No, of the 1.65 million that um, he would distribute 300 million and keep the 1.35 million 
in the state coffers. So uh, our counties, and so there was no guidance from the feds on how that was to be distributed. And um, so there's a lot of now county commissioners and city council members that are not pleased with that decision because there was not any um, discussion beforehand about what a what an allocation should be. Um, but then also, so I'll talk about some other things that we've been working on too, is um, the, we had a coordination meeting yesterday for uh, community development block grants. Um, there should be in our county, so we've got two rounds of this. Um, and so it's an asset for businesses where, and actually Mike um, Skinner, do you wanna talk about the first round of funding that um, there'll be $75,000 in total for businesses to apply for? Do I see Mike? Yeah, I'm here. Good. Um, yeah, it's, um, is that uh, for sure and moving forward? Mm -hmm. I talked to, last I talked to Karen Rowe at Department of Commerce, she's, I mean, we submitted the application as, you know, we wrote it. So she said it's just in process. I okay. guess it's not 100% sure, but I've given, been given no indication to think it's not happening. Okay. Well, so community development block grants are issued through HUD, but administered locally. And um, Washington State has a... <clears throat> Uh, funding specifically for microenterprise assistance um, that uh, they use for supporting nonprofits that <clears throat> work with small businesses. And they increased that by $1.8 million, I think. Um, and uh, that was then for the whole state. And that was then divided up among counties based on sort of pro rata and population and things like that. It's usually administered by the CAP agency in the county, which in um, the case of Clallam County is, and Clallam and Jefferson County is only CAP. <clears throat> but we um, asked if we could um, instead uh, use the $132,000 that was allocated for Jefferson and Clallam County to go directly to the two EDCs, Team Jefferson and Clallam EDC to support a micro grant program for low moderate income micro entrepreneurs. So these are folks that make uh, less than 80% of the area mean income and have a micro enterprise, which is defined as owner operated with fewer than five employees. Um, and then we, themselves, right? Pardon? Including, including themselves. themselves. Yeah. yeah. So they could have max of four, but right. it also would be for hairdressers or cleaning professionals, you know, that kind of do things on their own, home care, health, um, individuals that work on their own. Yep. So we put together a very quickly, put together a, a proposal for how we could um, administer small grants to folks that would be eligible for this. Um, and divided that between Jefferson County and Clallam County, I think based on population, if I'm not mistaken. So about 40% goes to Jefferson County, about 60% goes to Clallam County. Um, and then- So it was by number of businesses. Sorry, that. sorry, Mike. It was by number of businesses in each county. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so that's what it is. And as soon as the funding is available, we'll announce that. and hopefully get small grants out to, I think the, we're hoping to help about 50 people and um, maybe make about 35 grants, kind of in the average area, about $2,500, $3,000. I am typing in what those income limits are. Um, and then I will share with you also that the state received another uh, 7.7 .7 million, they're distributing 7 million of that. And they, uh, our county should get somewhere near 500,000 of the COVID-19 HUD uh, dollars. 
and the we had a coordination meeting yesterday afternoon between um, uh, one of the county commissioners and each of the city managers and Eric Lewis from um, the hospital and uh, anyway so they have not the state has not come out with the exact requirements for these cdbg funds but i understand that well cdbg funds these community development block grants that come from hud are almost not worth winning because of the administrative requirements but they are going to streamline the process supposedly and it much more easier, uh, less cumbersome to administer the dollars. Um, and so uh, there, they, we had this discussion yesterday, we were told that if we apply as a consortium, then we will receive uh, more funding than if individual entities apply because 161 different entities could apply for the seven million dollars the state had for these purposes and so there was agreement amongst the three cities and the county to apply in as one application um but how that will be used it could you know there's it could be used for um health services uh you know, rental assistance, uh, utility assistance, that kind of thing, or micro enterprise. So based on population, the um, they're going to allocate the funding that way, I believe. But they're also talking about a component of need. Um, Rod Fleck from the city of Forks keeps on talking about how um, in in Forks, they they have three large manufactured home parks, mobile home parks, where uh, they the people that live there all were um, by and large uh, laid off and and small business owners. And so he's saying the city of Forks to support them being eventually evicted because yes, the their rent has been deferred soon as that lifts they'll maybe owe three four months worth of rent and won't have that to pay so um he's saying they need uh six at least sixty thousand dollars a month to help them from being um evicted out of the parks and they won't even have the money to move their mobile homes out of the parks so uh that's their need their screaming need there so and he's saying that the um he doesn't want to see a population allocation, but more of a need-based, stream need-based allocation. So that's ongoing, but they have decided to apply together. And um, uh, then, uh, and we'll see. And also, I just wanted to share that with the first round of funding, the EDCs, the two EDCs are going to be receiving the money, but we are taking none of it for ourselves in administrative costs. Um, and um, so I don't know if there's, I'm, I'm going to put in the income limits here uh, and for you to read. And then um, I've got to add a little information here, though. It's kind of a weird format. Sorry about that but I'm just trying to play. Um, so actually, I'm just going to, if I can, post this. Uh, trying to anyway. Uh, huh. Doesn't want to let me. I don't know. Is that, did that go post? Yeah. Okay, so it's uh, for one person to qualify for CDBG funds, it's thirty-seven thousand two fifty or less. Uh, for if there are two people in your household, it's forty-two thousand six hundred. Three people, forty-seven nine. Four people, fifty-three two. And then on from there, five people, fifty-seven five, six sixty-one seven five. And then, you know, if you have seven or eight people in your household, it's sixty-six thousand or seventy thousand. 
So it's pretty low for people to qualify for those funds. Um, you know, the city has programs, they put $250,000 into their utility program to support people that can't pay their utilities and that are um, can show economic uh, injury and, you know, a low uh, threshold of income. And then also they have 50,000 for rental assistance. And so they want to replenish that with some of these CDBG funds uh, for lower income and moderate income individuals. Um, and so if you've got, you know, people that live in the city limits that are lower income, that is a, um, is a resource for them. The PUD on the other hand does not have any programs. They've listed the D, uh, DCAP Disaster Community Assistance Program, but the amount of money, and that's a uh, D program, but the amount of money that you can make according to that program is so incredibly low. It's like $400 a month. So I don't, uh, I hope very, very few people would qualify for that. Um, that have utility bills. And, um, but Andrew, that's something, uh, you know, if there's people that come through the food bank or that kind of thing, maybe, maybe we could work on um, a resource sheet if they don't have access to the internet or something that you can share with them what different options are. Yeah, if I can speak real quick, is that okay? Yeah, please. Um, so just a couple of things on that. OLICAP also has a COVID response fund where you can get rental utility assistance and such. Um, so I would definitely, I don't know, they, they also have to show a direct, it, it, is, it is for people that are directly affected by COVID. So they have to show that um, that has occurred to be able to receive funds from there. Um, it may, I'm not really sure on the details of that. It may just be a one shot gig for that, for that and not ongoing, but, um, it's something. And it's 150,000. Isn't that right? I don't, know, I don't know what the fund is. Um, I have a meeting after this one, um, a SQUIM health and housing collaborative meeting where, I, you know, um, OLICAP is part of that collaborative with us. Um, mm -hmm. I can get more information for that. And on that point, um, through that collaborative effort, we have created a one sheet, um, just a resource list that we are, you know, we're going to use at the food bank or wherever else. Um, just it's specific, you know, to it's, it's kind of SQUIM Health and Housing Collaborative specific, but it does, um, you know, hit a lot of human services needs, um, mm -hmm. physical health, mental health, substance use. Um, Great. Housing and shelter and food and security. So that is, we do have that available um, and we are working on that. Yeah. Thank you. So I've on, on the choose column first website, not under business resources, but rather um, uh, consumer side of it, there's financial assistance. So I would love if you would send that to me and I'll add those things in there. And what I do have uh, on there is the only cap 150,000 for um, people, but again, I believe that's people that are at below a minimum, you know, a, a certain amount of income, which are probably those limits that um, I put in the chat box. So uh, one, I'm sorry, one more thing. Um, the 833 column County toll free, if there's, you know, if we can make sure that that's on there as well. I mean, that's an, that's becoming an excellent resource. Um, okay. the, the, the information that is there is 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 updated instantly. It's in a live document, and the person managing that is, you know, making sure that that information is that 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 toll free number is using is accurate and correct and up to date. And um, the county EOC is using that document as well as the the toll free two one one services right now are automatically diverted to that eight three three number. So that's um, so they are receiving as accurate information as, as, as can be done for okay. any services. It's not just health and human services. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's meant to be a document for all services that people need. Okay, great. Can you put in the chat box what that 833 number is? Yeah, I great. can do that. 
Okay, terrific. Um, I know that, okay, Working Washington Grant, uh, which was not limited for income purposes. Um, and I think there's starting to show a bit of a gap that so many of these programs have been targeted to the you know, lower income, which absolutely is needed. However, suddenly people at higher income amounts have no income in some cases. And so we're trying to identify uh, those gaps. And we did have a, um, Marco Zayas called it a Clallam Cares Steering Committee meeting end of last week. And uh, where we're trying to identify what the needs are generally and what the resources are and then where those gaps are so that we can target new funding or any new programs into those gap areas. But I, I think what we're definitely finding is the gaps are more like canyons and uh, the funding is a trickle. And so, um, but I think we wanna look at things on from a need-based perspective. And uh, so we'll go from there. One of the, uh, another, another item um, is that the opportunity fund dollars uh, we've been told now that the, the, um, uh, uh, let's see. Yep. Good point about the personal Facebook pages. Um, the, the, um, uh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought here. Um, oh, the opportunity fund dollars that the county has is a couple million bucks. And they are, uh, they've said that they don't want to take applications at this point. They want to um, direct how those funds are spent. They just, I know uh, we received an application the other day on Monday, right after the county commissioners discussed that they wanted to put things on hold because they want. Uh, they want to really direct how those funds are spent at this point, um, rather than um, potentially some good requests, but that won't have the kind of impact that everyone needs right now. Um, so that has been, that was a, a action that was just recently taken. Um, and uh, oh, the Working Washington grant, that the state has said that they believe by tomorrow that all the graders that have looked at the, um, I guess about 5,000 applications that came in will be reviewed and then the um, Commerce is going to by county select which ones they will fund uh, and send that over to the governor. His he and his staff will sign off, and then those will be coming forward. But I anticipate we should know hopefully uh, by the end of next week uh, who received that funding. But we're also hoping that uh, in in our county received 620 applications from business owners, um, and so. All in all, there were almost 900 applications that we received, but the vast, well, um, close to 300 either were blank and they had to resubmit or they were from another county or they had not been in operation for a year or they were a nonprofit or something was wrong with it. So um, we, all in all, we had about 620. So we're gonna be getting back in touch with those people. Um, Another resource for businesses still is that Coastal Communities Fund that is uh, up to $25,000 and it's 2.44% interest. So really low interest rate. And they're, all payments are deferred for at least six months. Uh, the information on that is on our website under loans, under business resources and loans. Um, and then now CRAF3 uh, has got an application into the 
the uh, co county commissioners. So I want to back up for a minute. The AG on April 6th issued a, an opinion letter that because the governor had to shut down the economy, if cities and counties spend money to, or ports for that matter, or PUDs spend money to help businesses, it is not considered gifting of public funds or, and it's not considered loaning of public credit. So completely, you know, um, that, that was such a limiting issue for uh, our state for decades in comparison to other states. So I know that the city of Squim announced they had, they had really, really healthy reserves because of Costco and Home Depot primarily, but um, they're taking $1.8 million out of their reserves and, um, and they are using it for nonprofit support within the city limits but they also are giving $250,000 to the Squim Chamber of Commerce for their um, Squim Business Recovery and Relief Program. I think I got that name wrong, but uh, they've got that where they're issuing grants and to entities. So if the business is within the city limits of Squim and it's a brick and mortar company, they are going to issue $25,000, $10,000 grants through the Chamber of Commerce. So again, as we're looking at what are the resources and what are the gaps, uh, we recognize that a business in inside the city limits of Squim could potentially get an idle loan. It could get a PPP, you know, you know well, let me start over, an idle grant you know, up to 10,000. They could get also a uh, PPP loan. They could get the Working Washington grant from the governor of 10,000. They could also get a $10,000 grant from the Squim Chamber of Commerce and some other, and maybe pandemic unemployment assistance. And then you've got some other business that is not within the city limits that maybe is getting nothing. And so we really want to identify who, you know, as we roll out new programs and new funding mechanisms, what entities are have received what money and, and where are these gaps? So if anybody wants to be involved with that work, happy to have you um, engage that way, especially um, I know this Clallam Cares Steering Committee uh, initially was thinking they would spend all these dollars on nonprofits, but I think if we're really looking at business resilience, we need to think about, um, well, no, not business. If we're thinking about community resilience, in my view, the way to truly create resilience is a strong economy where all people can participate. And um, that if we don't have, you know, if we've got our border shut down, which currently that is I don't know if you guys saw the, the um, article from the Victoria Times um, where Destination British Columbia was interviewed, but they're, they're basically saying there's, um, there's a good chance that the border won't be opened up until next summer. And Black Ball is saying they, you know, that's not plausible for them. And uh, so, and they're, as everyone knows, opening those, um, opening that rather the tourist industry really keeps our restaurants and our hotels alive through the summer months. You know, they just get by during nine months out of the year and then they make their money in the summer months. So if, if uh, the borders shut down and we won't have tourists coming through on Black Ball or people from the I-5 corridor going to Victoria. Um, and if there's a real limitation on people coming from the I-5 corridor to the Olympic National Park as an example, 
all of our cities uh, and those businesses are going to be seriously impacted. Does anybody want to add anything there or I can put the article link in the chat box if you'd like. Anybody else can speak. I don't have to hold the floor here. Um, so something else that uh, we're we've been talking about, and I know that um, PA Chambers been talking about, but that is, um, you know, how do we? Obviously, a lot of bad things are coming out of this from a consumer buying process decision and um so but there's positive things that are coming out of it too and so if we are going to try to prevent a wholesale drastic implosion of our economy um i think we need to get businesses and people with wealth to provide some venture capital to start up businesses in areas that will have a strong growth potential. And um, so, you know, that's, um, there were there were a couple different ideas that were thrown out there, but I would love to get more input from people as well. I mean, obviously things with Zoom and internet, um, bicycle, um sales and outdoor recreation where you can do social distancing should be thriving um and uh anyway those kind of things um ppe manufacturing the the composite recycling technology center is now manufacturing um face masks the um the screens i don't think i said it right uh, but you know when the medical professionals have the shield and then the plastic that covers they're manufacturing this piece out of recycled carbon fiber now um, and so that's a real growth opportunity there's a real demand for medical glass you know different um, and there's an interest in potentially having a for better I, I can't think of a better way to describe it, but an Olympic Peninsula Amazon, where people could, you know, we'll have our own instead of exporting all of our dollars to out of the area. And, um, and so, it, and that's something that Bill Herman's very interested in and that he might be willing to be involved with and fund. So, uh, you know, if, if we had a, I don't know if you guys noticed, but we put out a uh, Mother's Day uh, constant contact email. And, um, you know, where we just had a, a dozen businesses say, yeah, you could, you know, put our name on there. And so that's on our website now and let people know they could buy locally something for Mother's Day that we'll get it shipped to them or, you know, they could pick it up or whatever. But, um, that not to necessarily use Amazon. And I'll tell you, if you go to that, um, if you go to that email, look at the address at the bottom, you get a little sneaky uh, rebellion there. <laughs> so Colleen? Yes. How do we get on that? We, we saw that, Cable Fiber saw that, and we launched our online site on the 22nd. And we're still figuring out this social media. We only use our newsletter and the Facebook page. So is that picked up as an Instagram or something else? Because we would love to use this as a learning opportunity for us to know how to get captured by people that are looking for those. We placed an ad in the paper and we actually got several sales on Sunday because it came out in Sunday's paper. But how would we get it so that somebody in, how did somebody see it for the EDC to put out that short list of 12 businesses? Um, okay, so uh, Matt Acker is running a lot of our social media work and Jackie and Ashley have forgotten their last names, but I can uh, give, 
put your information on the chat box and I will put you in touch with them. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so if, um, if people are interested in that kind of um, conversation, uh, let me know. I think next week when we have this chat, if uh, people can add more information on it, I mean, we really are going to have to be thinking about, you know, how we pivot and what we can export out of this area to people through the mail and how do we serve ourselves while the tourism opportunity is really diminished. Um, and so uh, I'm, I don't wanna create another meeting, but I would love it if um, people could, you know, give, have some give and take and we do like I said we do have some local investors that are interested in certain things so um, you know love to get that going so that we have some positive progress rather than um, just watching everything collapse um, I see Mary Jane I see you're on any chance you could give us any type of update from the federal side? Hate to put you on the spot like that, but she may have lost. Sorry, I was having a little problem uh, unmuting there, Colleen. Um, I, I don't really have any particular updates at this point. Um, it appears, um, uh, you know, that the house, um, uh, will be um, uh, in session in some fashion next week. So we may hear more uh, this coming week about what, um, uh, you know, additional uh, stimulus uh, or relief, excuse me, uh, measures might be like moving forward. So perhaps more information next week, Colleen, uh, than this. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really, uh, how do you think things have gone so far, Mary Jane? What kind of input have you, have you been gathering from the Olympic Peninsula? And can you share, is it, would you say we are really similar to the other areas of, um, of Derek's district or is it, do you see any differences? Um, well, I would say, um, uh, you know, as was mentioned uh, very early in this call when, uh, um, uh, when I first joined, uh, you know, that I have certainly heard from uh, some constituents, uh, you know, who have been uh, concerned about their unemployment um, and, uh, um, were heard from some constituents, you know, when additional funds uh, were made available through PPP, uh, that they were very excited that, uh, you know, perhaps their applications would now be moving forward. As far as uh, how we might compare to, uh, to the other areas, uh, you know, we've, uh, uh, we've asked for a little more information about uh, some of the programs and how those funds uh, were uh, awarded. Uh, but we have yet to hear, uh, you know, that particular information. So I couldn't compare uh, necessarily between uh, counties here in Washington 6th District, other than I know, uh, you know, that in general, we've had a lot of uh, uh, constituent uh, inquiries uh, concerning unemployment and those stimulus checks, um, you know, that, you uh, uh, People were concerned about when they were going to have an opportunity to add their direct deposit information. You know, there were some difficulties with that IRS website in initially. Uh, you know, so we've been um, we've we've uh, heard from a lot of our constituents about those issues, and happy to know that the IRS has continued to work on making that website. Um, uh, a little more user friendly, uh, and they continue to update that information as we move forward. Okay. 
Right. I did also um, uh, note that IDLE is now open the loan um, portal. And I sent that out in a um, email yesterday, but uh, the portal is now open for at ag related businesses. I wonder if the food bank could claim that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but uh, and also for entities that received a confirmation number that began with the number two. So uh, if either of those are the case, then you can go back to the app, you know, the um, their portal right now. Um, Mary Jane, have you heard any news or updates on when the EDA, the Economic Development Administration, that is part of the US Department of Commerce, will be issuing their notice of funding opportunities? I have not, Colleen, but I am happy to uh, ask that question of the, our folks in DC. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, does anybody else want to share any information at this point? I would think, you know, another area where there might be more demand is, I see Brian's name on here, but is IT support, since everybody's now going to be connecting through the internet, um, obviously a lot more demand for broadband, and that's something that we really, you know, if there's a lot of money that comes in the next tranche of funding from the feds and it's all around infrastructure and construction, I'm very concerned that it's going to be Seattle and Tacoma companies that get these jobs and these contracts and it's not going to be local people by and large. I just saw an article um, on the Washington State Wire uh, where the state was celebrating that there's a new, um, uh, that there's a culvert that's gonna go in um, on Highway 101 for Seabert and Bagley Creek, and it's a $30 million contract. Uh, and that'll go through, it's gonna start soon here and go through 2021. And they were saying in the article, the quote from Representative Jake Fay, who is the committee chair of the Transportation Committee, that the Olympic Peninsula struggles economically, but here is a great success where we're sending $30 million for this project. But Scarcella Brothers from Seattle won the contract. And, um, you know, I know that the that Lakeside will be a sub, I'm, I'm sure they always are, um, but they're a company that's owned out of Bellevue. And they're, uh, so, you know, very little of that money actually stays locally. And so because of bonding requirements and the like, and our local businesses just are not able to compete. And um, Mary Jane, one thing that I wanted to, I know I'm a bit of a broken record on this subject, but um, it if uh, what our state does is they use those PTAC centers, the Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, they're basically the SBDC for businesses on, um, for contractors learning how to compete on, um, and it's not just contractors, but any kind of businesses to compete in the realm of federal contracts, but it's also state contracts and local contracts. So if a business owner has questions about the state law, our state uses those PTAC centers and has gives them funding to, um, to help entities, business owners understand how to engage in that process. And so um, it's not just federal dollars, it's also, out, you know, if someone locally wants to learn how do I compete on, getting a, you know, let's say it's to build a outdoor bathroom, I want to um, put a bid in for the Port of Port Angeles or the city, they, they've got an RFP request for proposals out to build an outdoor bathroom. Um, the entity that they go to to get any specific advice on that is in Bremerton. 
And those, the really nice counselors in Bremerton, they have no funding for travel. And you have to, first of all, know that they exist and you have to get down to Bremerton to get that um, support. And they require you to go to PTAC 101 first, which they offer on a quarterly basis. And again, you have to go down to Bremerton to do that. And that's just not, you know, that's a, a impediment that people say, oh, forget it, I'm just not gonna bother. And then also there's the bonding requirements. So I'm not gonna go into those, but there's, um, you know, bigger business have a 4% advantage over small business without a lot of uh, history. And so big business keeps on getting all the same contracts. And it doesn't, it doesn't, that money doesn't sink into small rural communities into the small companies and the local workers by and large. And you can see oh. the proof of that by the hotels, one of the biggest um, uh, opportunities is these union employees from Seattle and Tacoma that stay in the hotels when they have the contracts and the public works contracts here locally. Mike, you want to? I, was, I, I wanted to make a, a quick announcement. Please. Um, I just found out this morning that the, the Washington State Small Business Development Center um, in Wazoo um, applied for additional COVID-related funding for COVID-related technical assistance. And they just got the notice of award this morning. And what that means for us out in Port Angeles is that we're going to be hiring a new full-time business advisor um, as soon as possible. Um, the contract is technically starts April, so we're already behind the eight ball. To um, focus specifically on helping low-income, underserved micro entrepreneurs and micro enterprises access relief, you know, emergency relief funding. Um, but also to um, use that as a teachable moment to help people strengthen their businesses and become more resilient uh, with a whole focus on resiliency. And Mike uh, Rykoff, this, will, this position will have one foot in our camp and kind of a one foot in your camp as well as far as like workshops and leveraging all the good work that the Small Business Development Center Network has been doing on resiliency and, and disaster preparedness and all of that. So it'll be of real full court press on helping folks into the recovery stronger than they were before. Um, so we're hiring and I just want to kind of put that out to this network and say, um, you know, I, <laughs> I've got so much going on right now, but we'll have positions descriptions probably next week. We'll probably put this out on Idealist and Indeed and the usual Kind of job hiring networks but the best way for us to find the right people is through all of you um so colleen i'm looking at you specifically oh, yeah. um, put the put 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 your ear to the ground let us know who you think might be good Dirt, we're hiring two positions one is a full-time business advisor um and and um the the other is a, a part-time administrative assistant so instead of um uh, there's a person that has been helping us with that in the Tequila office at the SBDC who's going to get repurposed and shuffled around a bit. So this is our opportunity to hire someone locally in Port Angeles to basically help with program coordination and administration out of our Port Angeles office at the port building. Um, so part-time, I think we're thinking 20 hours a week um, position for admin assistance and a full-time person who's got entrepreneurial experience, a real passion for working with underserved communities and, and can really um, develop our ability to help them strengthen their business. That's great. It is great. It's good news for us. We're excited yeah. to, to, to put that person to work. Some of that federal funding starting to come through then. Yes, it is. Um, it, it's a separate, it's not related to core funding. So, you know, they're, they're kept in very separate buckets. So this position is specifically only to sort of dedicated to COVID-19 response work. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's an 18 month position, but of course we'll look for opportunities to extend it beyond 18 months. Um, and uh, we're hired, we're looking now. So um, as soon as I can, we'll have position descriptions available. If you know of anybody, um, let us know. We'll reach out to them. Okay. Great, Great. news. Um, so Jeffrey Gonzalez asked about PPP uh, forgiveness and Mike Rykoff, just so you know, in the chat box, I put in your cell phone number and told him to give you a call because we did kind of review that. Um, and then Cindy Kelly uh, has said, I'm hearing frustrations on both sides of the governor's plan, phase in plan. It's not clear what are others hearing. Um, I, I was interviewed yesterday by um, Leah Leach, who was doing an article, it may be in today's paper, I don't know. But yeah, there's, um, so one of the things is, you know, that, so he's moving in these different phases, different types of businesses get to open up in different phases, but, uh, and some counties, 10 counties are able to move forward potentially if they apply, they were given the opportunity to apply to the Secretary of the Department of Health to move faster. And we were not in that group of 10 counties. The, um, our three legislators, state legislators, sent a letter to the governor yesterday asking that Clown County be included in the 10 counties that are able to apply uh, to move in faster. But um, Dr. Unthank is, um, is the one who would organize that. And she has said that she thinks, well, first of all, we could go through the whole process and then they could tell us no. Another issue is that uh, with those 10 counties, they said, they put out something about it's for counties with fewer than 50,000 in population, but Grays Harbor is one of the counties listed and they have 75,000 people in their county. And I understand they're not interested in going any faster. Um, and so, uh, but what really is the threshold of whether the governor put the county in that list is whether you had gone three weeks without having a case. And we have not, we're at 18 cases as of yesterday, though the Department of Health listed 19, but that was a clerical error. Um, and 17, and she said on Monday that 17 of those 18 people have recovered. And each of the cases were from travel exposure, not community spread. So, um, right now, our exposure is pretty low, but if, you know, visitors come from the I-5 corridor, that could um, change. And so one of the big factors is, do we have enough PPE and do we have testing capacity? And according to Eric Lewis last week, he told me that they have the testing capacity here and they're doing the contact tracing training, but a limiting factor currently is that they don't have enough of the reagents or the cartridges for the test kits to meet the threshold requirements for us to move into that next phase safely. So um, yes, there was the letter to um, the governor from our three legislators, but I don't know that that's really gonna go very far. Uh, we'll see. Um, but, uh, and, and yes, there is quite a bit of confusion, but I think the, and there's two factors for moving in for a business to move into opening. And that is uh, number one is, is your geography, is your county allowed to move forward? Or are you part of the state's larger uh, phased plan? And number two is, has your industry sector created a system of protocols that has been approved by the Department of Health and the state. And so like hairdressers, they don't have an association that's working on protocols. Retail does, construction does, and they, you know, handled things. 
Um, what else? What other large industries have? But um, uh, there's another one that, anyway, healthcare, those entities have a, an association that worked together and uh, submitted a series of protocols to be approved. But, you know, massage therapists, um, cleaning ladies, do they have an association? No that would then go to the governor's office and say, here's what we propose. So um, I'm afraid that those entities will be kind of at the back of the line. Um, and may, that may be a problem. Uh, and I'm wondering if that's something that different, you know, um, groups could start working on trying to self organize maybe through social media. Um, to be able to open up their industry type. Is that, was that kind of clear or, um, or is it confusing? Anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens through that process. Um, and it is nine o'clock. Does anybody have anything more they want to add at this point? The, the, Information comes out very quickly, and I know it's easy to miss things, and I'm doing this full time, and I know I'm missing things, so I get it if other people have real jobs and they're just trying to e read the emails later to hear what's happening. Colleen, how do the, the small businesses that are retail find out um, about who to send their plan to? Beth wrote up a plan for us, but we don't know who to send it to um, so that when it's, we're allowed to open, we can open. <laughs> so the Washington Retail Association, which, you know, you don't have to be a member of it, but you can um, get, they, they're the ones that created for the retail industry a comprehensive protocol plan. I know the guy, uh, Bruce Beckett, was hired to do it uh, on their behalf. And he basically started with the construction plan that had been um, approved by the governor. And so anyway, I can give you, uh, I can Google it, but it's the Washington Retail Association. And if you cannot find it on there, I do have a copy of their draft and um, I can send that to you as well. But I don't know if they finalized it. Um, but uh, they they may very well have it on their website. But okay, we'll we'll go we'll go look that up. We just didn't know we yeah. wrote our own. So um, okay, of what we're doing and what we think is the best practices. And from my food days, I kind of know sure. those practices. So, uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, yeah, but we'll go look this up. And then and then does that just mean that when they say that the local retailers can open up for you know limited people in their store and things that we'll we'll just find out about that um yeah i you know uh, i would think so but being proactive um if you you know you would i i would hate for you that if they submit some kind of plan and it does not work for you for whatever reason I would think you would want to review the plan before they have submitted it for approval so that they can make some kind of, you know, caveat for a small cable fiber business or something, you know. Um, so uh, I, I believe that they will be and they'll have on their um, coronavirus.wa.gov site information about the different kind of industries and what those plans um, need to be. You know, the governor is having, he's now, not to editorialize, but finally created advisory committees on to help him with some of these decision processes. And um, I was really disappointed that he doesn't have economic development or, you know, our economy or tourism or you know something as one of the three groups. Uh, it was a work safe group. So it's basically L and I making sure there's um, safe uh, 
in a, in the workplace, things are safe, not about we are really going to be impacted and how do we overcome this. He didn't include anything like that. And um, I think there's there was real hope from the Department of Commerce that he would, uh, but he he chose not to. So if you know, maybe we could uh, if you can. I know our legislators are really concerned about that, um, but you know, I don't know how we are able to influence that decision more readily. If you have, you know, people, different legislators that you know and work with, maybe you could share with them that you think having an advisory committee that would uh, allow for some balance while we're trying to ensure that the virus doesn't spread is an important element to be exploring. So if nobody has any more, I'll go ahead and call it a morning and you guys can get on with your day. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.